The U.S. Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces heard oral arguments today in the case of the U.S. versus Daniel King. Mr. King is charged with passing secrets to the Russians while serving in the U.S. Navy. Today's proceedings were an hour and a half. Judge, the Associate Judges, and the Senior Judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable, the United States Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces is now open and in session. God save the United States of America and this Honorable Court. Please be seated. Good morning. The Court is about to hear our argument in the case of the United States versus King. The order of argument will be uh, this morning. Uh, first, the appellant's counsel, Professor Turley, for 30 minutes, and you may reserve time from rebuttal out of that. Then we will hear from our two amici, first, the National Institute of Military Justice, and secondly, the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, followed by the government for 30 minutes, and then any rebuttal, if there is some. Are there any questions? Very well. Then we'll call United States versus King. Professor Turley. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. With the consent of the court, I would like to reserve 10 minutes for rebuttal. Granted. Thank you. May it please the court, my name is Jonathan Turley, and I represent the petitioner appellant in this matter, Petty Officer Daniel King. Petty Officer King is under pretrial detention on suspicion of espionage. If convicted on these charges, he faces the death penalty in this case. Many of the facts in this case are in dispute, and we submit cannot be resolved absent a remand of the record for fact-finding. However, it is our position that the court is faced with two threshold questions that it can and should resolve at this stage. First, on the facts before the court, the jurisdictional question in this appeal should be resolved to establish that military courts do have the authority to issue writs in cases pending Article 32 hearings. What do you cite for that? Uh, well, Your Honor, in our view, the lower court erred by failing to note that the courts have jurisdiction under the potential jurisdiction authority under the All Rights Act at 28 U.S.C. 1651. The All Rights Act? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I said All Rights Act. Yeah, it's a, yeah. Sorry, Freudian. <laughs> Maybe you thought it's All Rights. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the All Rights Act. The yeah, All Rights Act. Uh, quite right. Uh, the, um, but the, also, this court has jurisdiction, in our view, under Article 67 of the Uniform Military, uh, the Uniform Code of uh, Military Justice, and it also well, hasn't has this court in the past acted uh, to regulate um, proceedings involving Article 32s. Yes, Your Honor, it, it did so in ABC versus Powell. Uh, that was the McKinney case. Yes, Your Honor. Yeah, and uh, and how about in the Pruro case? Yes, Your Honor. The, this court has previously indicated that uh, the jurisdiction of this court begins at the Article 32 stage. Actually, you can trace the jurisdiction if you uh, want to RCM 202A when there's a view to prosecution. But in our view, it's the essence of the jurisdiction of this court to supervise the military justice system. This is the most critical stage of any criminal prosecution, uh, is before that Article 32 stage. If the argument of the government is accepted, you would create this sort of bizarre blind spot within the military justice system in which no matter how egregious a violation by the government, no matter how outrageous the conduct of the government may be, there is no recourse to this court. And in our view, that is an extreme and untenable position, and we think in, it should be in rejected. In the Pruner case, Consul, uh, uh, there was an Article th 32 held, and then the military judge ruled that, uh, that there were, the appellant's waiver was invalid. Right. And so he ordered a new pretrial investigation and referral. Right. And, and this court acted in that case. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, so, so, so ABC versus Powell and the Pruner case are, are the two things yes, you right. rely on today. That's correct. All right, proceed. So, Counsel, you, you would then argue that it would be in aid of this court's jurisdiction to exercise jurisdiction under the All Rights Act at this time? Yes, that's correct, Your Honor. Uh, we believe it's not only in the aid of this court's jurisdiction, it's the very essence of that jurisdiction uh, to act at this stage. But Counsel hadn't 
the Supreme Court in the United States versus Weiss and Hernandez recognize that the judge advocates general of the various services are the officials who are charged with uh, the functions that you're asking this court to do? Your Honor, I don't believe that the Supreme Court gave exclusive function I, um, outside this court to handle these matters. I believe that this court's jurisdiction is quite clear that as a federal court, this court supervises this criminal justice system. And I don't believe that the Supreme Court has ever maintained that this court lacks that jurisdiction, particularly in Clinton v. Goldsmith, which is cited below. I mean, the example in that... I'm not concerned at this point whether the court has jurisdiction. I'm concerned that who should do it first. I mean, well, it seems to me that this is appropriate. The subject matter of today's hearing is appropriate to be dealt with in the office of the Judge Advocate General at the first stage. Your Honor, I believe that when you have a case like the present one, where the convening authority has refused relief, particularly in a case where there's a denial of effective counsel, that a writ is, a, is the most appropriate and only form... But the convening authority is not charged with law of providing effective counsel. Th that's... The Judge Advocate General is. That's correct, Your Honor, but when there's a denial of effective counsel, I believe that this court must necessarily have immediate jurisdiction. Now, it, it may be that this court will resolve that it does not have that jurisdiction. I believe that um, there's nothing to support the ar argument that this court does not have writ authority immediately upon that deprivation. Now, in our view, the two threshold questions that should be addressed are the jurisdictional question and the question of the facial invalidity of the protective order that we've argued. And that's we, a right to counsel issue. Yes, Your Honor. The, we have also filed a motion for remand, which is currently pending before this court. Um, I learned yesterday that the government responded to that motion for a remand. I was never given a copy of that response, and I was never given a copy of the response supposedly filed uh, to the second writ petition as certified. You don't have it right now? I don't, Your Honor. And we told the clerk of court uh, yesterday that I can hardly respond to arguments that I have not been given. I was just told this morning that government counsel received a copy, uh, but I have never been served on that, and we've complained four times about service problems, uh, and we object to the practice. But as I mentioned, in terms in terms of the Clint v. Goldsmith case, uh, we believe that that is distinguishable on its face. Goldsmith dealt with a case in dropping a serviceman from the rolls. The Supreme Court emphasized facts which clearly distinguish it from our current circumstance. In that case, the court emphasized that this was a long, closed case. The serviceman actually had been released, was no longer serving a sentence, and the court put great stress on that. And the court also noted that this was the independent act of another military agency. And so the court simply said that this court does not have continuing authority in a case that has been long closed. That is readily distinguishable from a case involving a sailor who is facing the death penalty in an espionage case before a pre-Article 32 hearing. And I'll simply uh, once again uh, state that we see this as an untenable idea that this court does not have the jurisdiction to issue a writ in this, in, in this uh, fashion. And as Judge Olva noted, I believe that um, this court, in fact, has exercised uh, authority in that capacity. With permission of the court, I'd like to move to the protective order. The second threshold question before this court is simply, does the government, under any circumstances, have the authority to impose a monitoring agent on attorney-client communications? In our view, there's no fact-finding needed because there is no facts that would justify an unconstitu uh, unconstitutional restriction. Counsel, the government's April 24th response says, in essence, once all members of the defense team have security clearances, there will be no need for uh, the imposition of, of that ISO. Um, would this issue become moot if the government granted those security clearances promptly after this hearing or within a reasonable time after this hearing? Well, it would become moot if they dropped the monitoring agent. Um, I, For whatever reason, I'm perfectly agnostic whether they drop it because of the day time of the day or they drop it because of some other justification but and without asking you to testify before us but they ask <laughs> you what is in the record before us where do things stand in this record in terms of the relationship between the government and the defense as to the opportunity or requirement for applying for that security clearance well your honor i was never given I'm not asking you to testify. I'm asking you what's in the record of before us. Right. The, the record has within it a December 1999 uh, protective order, the first one in this case, referring to the handling of classified information. And That's the has, December 20th order you're referring to. Yes, Your Honor. And that has with it an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, to sign. 
That document was never given to me by the government. I didn't even know about that document until we received the second protective order. Now, in our view, the government has some burden, and if you look at the past cases that we cite, in fact, the government does have the burden to ask for an MOU to be signed. I was never asked for that, but when it was raised right before the Article 32, as is contained in the affidavits by the two lieutenants who have been detailed to this case, we repeatedly stated that I would sign an MOU. I'll sign an MOU today. I'll do it right now as long as it doesn't violate my client's rights. But we said that we would sign an MOU. All they had to do is to produce it, and as the affidavit stated in the record, it was never produced, it was never raised again. The only MOU, by the way, that was raised with regard to civilian counsel related to a document that was for official use only, which is also in, in the record, uh, and that document uh, was never produced, and so the MOU was never produced. As for the clearances, I was never told to get a clearance, and in fact, as the affidavits established, in the last meeting with the, st the staff judge advocate, we talked about stipulations that would avoid the need of classified evidence being used. Counsel, based upon this record, why isn't it a reasonable reading of the record for any counsel who reads this to say that the government is expecting the all counsel in this case to apply for a security clearance at the TSSCI uh, level? Well, first of all, Your Honor, in terms of the record, there is a dispute as to what was stated. Our two not, I'm not concerned about what was stated at what time. Right now, when the government files something and says, once all members of the defense team have the necessary clearances, the risk of disclosure is removed, there's no need for an ISO, why isn't a reasonable reading of that that it's the obligation of all counsel in this case to apply for that clearance? Well, now on, on appeal, they have raised this issue. Certainly, they have notified us that we have to get clearances. I have no problem with that. The problem that is is that it was never uh, told to civilian counsel I, that it I understand that as to what happened in the past. But right. where we are right now, then do you agree that this record establishes that there is now a, an obligation upon counsel to apply for that clearance? I will agree that the government has stated that obligation to civilian counsel. I do not agree that the, the way the government presents the necessity of a clearance uh, can pass constitutional muster on all regards. So I it's your, it's your view that. then that in a case in which on the face of the charge, the charge involves classified information, that competent counsel can prepare for that, for that trial, uh, the pretrial proceedings in the trial of that case, without having the opportunity to actually review that information that's at issue? I'm not too sure, Your Honor. I believe that this case can be decided certainly without classified information. I don't believe they can make out a case for espionage. Uh, but I've also stated that I have a willingness to apply for clearance, uh, and that is in the record. And the only question we had, the only reason I didn't apply for a clearance before, and I'll, if, if it's necessary, I will apply for a clearance, is that I was told that we might be able to use stipulations to avoid the need of classified information. So we have uh, a situation here then that we frequently see, at least in Little League baseball games, where the pop-up's in the air and nobody wants to call for it or say who's going who's gonna to go get it. <laughs> Well, I'm not bullet Bob Turley, uh, who pitched for the Yankees, and I, I don't know if I can answer the baseball question, but what I can say is that um, we're not even playing in this game yet. I mean, we haven't been invited onto the field. What we're asking for is the right to speak to our client, prepare a case, which so we you're haven't. Waiting, you're waiting for, in effect, an engraved invitation from the Department of Navy to apply for that security clearance. Not an engraved invitation, just simply a direct reference to it would help. And certainly on appeal, the government has said many things that we had never heard before. Uh, and now part of the record. But what I do wish to emphasize is that the proposition that that you can impose a monitoring agent until everyone has the identical clearance, not just top secret, but any special access clearance, is completely out of sync with the, the, the cases. The government simply can't do that. If I apply for a clearance and they say, well, until you, you get special access clearance, we're going to have this monitoring agent, that is facially unconstitutional, and Consul, they cannot do that. Counsel, this is my file, and, and this case is but weeks old. <laughs> uh, and and I, I dare say that if it goes on much further, I'm sure it will, it will grow. Uh, so we have about four linear inches of, of motions and responses and replies. But basically, I'd like to focus on the needs of you and your client. And I see them as two, but I'd be, I'd be happy to, to, to have to supplement my listing of needs. And I see the needs of the government at, as two important needs and maybe uh, one less important needs. Now, you have a need 
uh, to prepare for the for possible trial of your client under very serious charges. Uh, he's charged uh, preliminarily with uh, espionage, with uh, giving classified information to the Russian embassy, and also two specifications of violation of regulation, disclosing classified documents to unauthorized people. Now, you have to prepare for possible trial. Is that one of your needs? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. The second need is, is in light of the circumstances with the government in the past several weeks, and in light of your filings before this court, you appear to have established, at least to me, the need to preserve and protect your attorney-client privilege so it's not broken by someone monitoring what's going on. Is that sort of a correct assessment of your needs? That is correct, Your Honor. All right, now let's go to the government's needs. The government is charged with enforcing law in this country, and so they have a need to proceed to a possible trial. Uh, and one of the steps toward it under the Uniform Code is this Article 32, which is some people have drawn an analogy to the article to the grand jury proceeding. It, do you recognize that's a need of the government? Certainly, Your Honor. All right. The second thing is, uh, and this is an, an, another important need, uh, they have a need to protect our nation's security by conducting in some form or another without getting your client to in incriminate himself uh, in, in, uh, in violation of the Fifth Amendment. They had a, have a need to conduct a debriefing to determine what possible damage uh, to our nation's security has been accomplished by a possible disclosure to the to the Russian embassy and other people. Do you agree that's another important need of the government? I think that's certainly an, an interest of the government, yes. Okay, so, so the, the other need is, and this is a lesser need brought out by some of your affidavits, and that is a need uh, uh, of the government. They have a regulation that says the command, uh, the commander needs to keep checking up on if one of his people is in prison, they need to have command visits to make sure he's being treated properly. That's under a regulation of the Navy. And do you recognize that that's a lesser important need, but net, nevertheless a need of the government? Um, on the last point, which goes to our second writ, um, I have significant problems with the idea of a command visit. Uh, simply by claiming that it's a command visit does not mitigate the problem <coughs> if certain questions were asked in that meeting that are inappropriate. I have significant problems with the questions that were reportedly asked. We don't have those facts before us. But I, I believe that the command visits, as they occurred in this case, violate my client's rights. Well, our case law can really certainly handle that because there is a case uh, involving on a command visit. Someone said this is a command visit, but they were asking incriminating uh, 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 information of the accused, and we held that was a violation of, of the United States versus Edwards. Yes, Your Honor. I'm so, so I mean, I, we have case law that can protect against any violation of that. I do have to say that there's nothing in the record to establish clearly this was a command visit. There's no affidavit submitted on that point. Um, but you submitted logs on that point. You submitted the logs that says people visited and they stated the purpose of their visit was a command visit. Yes, we haven't spoken to the person who conducted these visits. Um, as defense counsel, I'm not in a position to judge either way whether those logs are accurate or what was asked in the meeting. Well, let's go through the needs and then we'll get to the uh, what we can do about fulfilling these needs in a way that satisfies the Constitution and the laws of this country. The last need is to prevent King from disclosing uh, further information to unauthorized people. Is that? I would say that is an interest of the government, yes. Okay. All right. Now, those needs, uh, how, do, how do we, what's your solution for balancing those needs? Uh, isn't uh, under the Pruner case, uh, one of the steps that that is reasonable that you and and the other attorneys representing King need to do is apply for uh, security clearances, and the government needs to reasonably quickly streamline the process so they can get this classified uh, uh, clearance, and then maybe we can do away with this. Uh, uh, person who's uh, the investigative security officer, which you say is breaking the attorney-client privilege. 
Your Honor, in fact, we have submitted to the court citations of cases, including protective orders, that lay out the standard procedures for national security cases. This is not the first case involving uncleared counsel. I, I, argue, you know, I was lit the lawyer in some of these cases. The gentleman behind me represented some of these cases. None of us have ever heard of a protective order that contained a monitoring agent. The standard protective orders included in cases like Musha, bin Laden, the, lock, um, uh, the um, uh, other cases cited in the uh, brief include um, the requirement that you only review classified documents in secure locations. You often have to be required to do it in a SCIF. There's requirements as to its handling. In the Musha case, by the way, the government did not ask counsel to have a clearance, even though top secret information was uh, presented to counsel. Uh, and in fact, the court said that the clearance requirements could violate the Sixth Amendment. But the important thing in that case is that all of these cases have security officers. None of them contain a monitoring role for that officer. None of them contain restrictions <clears throat> upon unclassified communications or communications absent a statement that classified information will be reviewed. Counsel, and the, but, oh, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, it's quite right, Your Honor. In that argument there. But, but your time is running short, so let me, let me see if I can cut to the chase here and, and the, the clear follow-up to both Judge Efron and Judge Sullivan's questions would be this. You have stated in your pleadings that you are willing to apply for a security clearance. Are you still willing to apply for a security clearance? I've always been willing to apply for a security clearance, Your Honor. Uh, and I've stated that uh, earlier. But I, I would like to note that this court has the threshold question, that even if I apply for a security clearance, the imposition of a monitoring agent until mm. it's resolved, in our view, is uh, truly untenable. Well, we understand. That goes back to the right to counsel issue and the interference with the attorney-client relationship. Yes, Your Honor. You, and, you agree that the government has said that once you get the clearance that the security officer will no longer be a part of the program? Uh, in our view, that's immaterial, Your Honor. A, a single second with that monitoring agent is unconstitutional. He is not allowed to be in the room. Courts have said that you cannot monitor with, through a bugging device or tape recorder turning client privilege. But for some reason, the Navy believes that if you replace a tape recorder with a live security agent, somehow that changes the whole dynamic. It is a violation of my client's constitutional rights to have that officer in the room. What essentially it is, is to dangle a Damocles sword over his head, and he will never know for sure whether his words will cause that sword to fall. He'll have to decide what the interpretation of that security officer is. Will he adopt a liberal or a narrow interpretation of disclosure? Will he, will he report out of negligence? And before he makes any statement, he will have to balance those concerns. And the government stated in response to your show cause order, that this officer has a duty to report. All members of the Navy have that duty. And once it is reported, they must have some investigation. Now, it is beyond me how it can be claimed that the convening authority can give absolute immunity so that he will never be called as a witness. I believe that that is totally wrong as a matter of law. But I also don't see how he can report a violation without disclosing confidential information. And the government's assurance that it is not expected that he will disclose much confidential information, in our view, is rather curious. My client's not required to waive rights on the assurance of the government that its expectations are modest. I mean, my, my client has a right to speak freely with his lawyer. The Trammell case in the Supreme Court establishes that. This court's uh, uh, case in Ankeny clearly establishes that. And what we're talking about is the essentiality of any criminal representation. My, my client is facing the death penalty. He wants experienced counsel to help him through this morass to help him fight for his life. Counsel, and, I see that your red light is on, but I I'm have sorry, one, one further question along these of lines course. Of, of your argument. Can I assume from your argument this morning that the objection is not to having a security officer assigned to the defense team. The objection is that the security officer under this MOU is obligated to report back to the command if there are infringes upon national security or release of, of classified information that should not be released. So that if that obligation is taken away from the security officer, your objection is not to, to purely have a security officer there to assist you and the defense team. Your Honor, I'm happy with any experts that the Navy may give me. They may rain experts down upon me, but the key is that I have to be able to use those experts as I see fit. This isn't my expert. He's not under my control. The, last, the only instructions he received, which was disclosed for the first time in this appeal, was instructions from the prosecution in a meeting in which we were not notified, in which we did not participate. I don't have the authority to keep him out of the room. I can't even meet with co-counsel on it. I can even send an email without his being present. He's not my expert. He's a monitoring agent and that is facially unconstitutional even for a second and I would note in closing to the court that when you require a monitoring agent until you get a clearance we were told that clearance could take months 
and under the system that the government has set up any special access clearance would have to be acquired so everyone has the identical clearance now i had a clearance at the n s a i possess classified information many of the people behind me had clearances they possess classified information we're all under an obligation of law not to reveal what we know but we don't have monitoring agents following us well dan king's under the same obligation and he is unconvicted and there is no reason to believe that he will disclose classified information in this case Thank, Thank you, you very Honor. much. And of course, you've reserved time for rebuttal. We'll now hear from Mr. Philip Cave on behalf of the National Institute of Military Justice, and welcome back. Thank you, Chief Judge, judges of the court. Uh, may it please the court, I speak to you on behalf of the National Institute of Military Justice in a case in which Charles Dickens might surely appreciate. Tomorrow, you will celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Uniform Code of Military Justice and this court's own enabling in uh, legislation. In 1968, President Johnson signed amendments to that code and said that we're going to give the service member a first-class legal uh, system, first-class legal services. Tomorrow, you'll celebrate the best of times. But today, here we are in a bad situation where we once again have to ask a similar question. Can a military accused get full and unfettered effective assistance of counsel. Fifty years later, are these expectations realized? So this is the worst of times. Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> the punchline. <laughs> I read A Tale of Two Cities. <laughs> you were going to use the punchline somewhere else, weren't you? <laughs> I left it for Chief Judge Crawford, sir. I hope I didn't steal it. <laughs> you didn't. Thank you. Well, Dickens must be proud that he's still uh, alive and influencing uh, human, well, human and, behavior. And remember, Your Honor, that uh, it wasn't until 1836 in England that a prisoner charged with a felony or as a traitor got the right to counsel because at the time it was thought inconvenient to getting a conviction. And that was the Prisoner's Counsel Bill of 1836. Um, this court does have jurisdiction under the All Writs Act. It does fall, this case does fall within the principle of uh, its, this court's pr um, potential jurisdiction. And as Chief uh, Judge Sullivan recognizes, you have exercised your jurisdiction in previous Article 32 investigations, and I don't think you need to go back to RCM 202 for that point. You have serious preferred charges. The Solicitor General himself of the United States has recognized that there are cir circumstances that could come before this court under the court's potential all rich jurisdiction. And there is nothing in the Supreme Court decision of Goldsmith that prohibits you exercising your potential jurisdiction here in order to supervise the military justice system of which you are recognized as the Supreme Court of the military. The government itself has sought to utilize the All Writs Act before this court. This case does, in a sense, expose a substantial flaw in the system. And that is the difference between King and the GS civilian co-accused at the desk next to him. There is no standing court and there is no military judge to go to, which is an additional reason why, as General Hudson recognized 20, more than 20 years ago, uh, that this would create a problem for the military system. And so you must act. And this is a death penalty case, as has been said. Once again, we have unqualified, inexperienced counsel detailed to a death penalty case. A case which this, the type of case which this court has recognized requires a heightened standard of reliability, due process, and fairness. And you've said that in other cases. And so we would ask you, the, military, the Institute of Military Justice would ask you to ensure not only that Petty Officer King gets effective assistance of counsel, but that the general public see that this system is fair and that he will get properly represented. There is a colorable claim of prosecution interference with the right of the defense counsels and the accused to speak with each other. There is a colorable claim that the defense counsels, especially the military defense counsels, have been chilled 
in their current actual representation of this accused. Uh, they fear perhaps court-martial themselves. The government has declared Petty Officer King a walking, talking piece of classified information, something that not even the military judge can do under Military Rule of Evidence 505, nor can the convening authority do under 405G6. And then what it does is a senior grade prosecutor goes to the defense counsel, a junior lieutenant, and says, you will not talk to your client, nor will you talk to each other. Now imagine that you're the sailor sitting in the passageway outside, or more importantly, you're the mother of the sailor sitting in the passageway outside, and you overhear that conversation. What do you think? What is the perception that you get of whether or not your son or daughter can get counsel in the military? And then they say, and by the way, we're going to put a government agent on your team. And this government agent who we have briefed, we the prosecutor have briefed, is charged to report certain conversations back to us. And then we see that perhaps they're taking advantage of the command visit program mm -hmm. to interrogate the accused, not just about the offenses, but whether or not he likes his lawyer. What better way for the prosecutor, for the government to interfere with the relationship between the accused and his lawyers? That trust, what is it that defense counsel need the most, if, especially if they're in uniform with a military accused? You need trust, and you don't have it, because in this case, the government has inserted itself. Now, whether or not that's because they weren't properly detailed, whether or not the Judge Advocate General of the Navy failed in his responsibility under Article 6 to make sure there was a fair, uh, whether or not they were qualified counsel, at this point in time, that's <clears throat> not the real issue. Counsel, tell me about the threat to junior military attorneys representing a king in this case. You, you mentioned something about maybe there was a, a threat of retaliation or implied or real. I'm sure it's sure. Not real, what? but perhaps it's implied. Could you give us your view on that? The Navy has a history going back to the Walker spy scandal of prosecuting and defending these cases. And throughout that history, including this case, the lawyers involved have always understood that as military officers, they have a double responsibility. One is to represent the accused according to their, um, their ethics as a lawyer, but also they have a responsibility to protect national security. And the Institute is not arguing that some of the things that have been done here should not have been done. Clearly, the government uh, does have an absolute right to take some steps to protect the interest. But under the circumstances, a junior officer, a young lawyer who doesn't apparently have any mentorship according to the facts, is left with the impression, and the public is left with the impression, and that's just as important, that if they somehow violate these directives or orders, they're going to be in trouble. Now, maybe court martial is too, too big of a, a word to use. Maybe it would be non-judicial punishment or some sort of administrative punishment. But under the circumstances... Hurting their career? Sir, uh, Your Honor? Hurting their career, possibly? Yes, even if it's a... As you well know, Your Honor, you have, you've been around the military long enough to know that um, damned with frank praise in a fitness report, and where does your career go? Exactly. Um, and I think that would be the point. You must act. You have many alternatives. Whether or not you retain jurisdiction of this case, and you, in effect, get a military judge, and you do that by having them act as a special master, or you remand this case to the court below to have the court do what it should have done in the beginning. Some, somebody in the appellate courts must act to protect this accused right to a fair trial. Why couldn't we remand this uh, to the Judge Advocate General of the Navy for resolution in, in line with sure. Judge, uh, Senior Judge Cox's line of questioning earlier? Um, that might be, you could perhaps send a directive to the Judge Advocate General of the Navy in connection with the military lawyers and their status as the security clearances. I think you could do that. However, this is, this would be the equivalent of the Judge Advocate Navy, of the Navy giving an order 
to a three-star admiral acting, or maybe four-star, I forget, I apologize, um, acting as a convening authority. Remember, we have said, this court has said that an Article 32 is a judicial proceeding. If it's a judicial proceeding, you would be ordering a member of the executive to order the convening authority to do something in connection with 32. And that goes, in a sense, maybe we're back to Carlucci. How about uh, the, the Pruner case? In that case, we said that uh, uh, the, the military judge uh, uh, conduct, you know, be the arbitrator of, of this, uh, of this uh, uh, you know, getting the clearance, any problems in getting the clearance, but we need an impartial person down there, and, and perhaps the Judge Advocate General, uh, m maybe we should do like our case law says in Pruner, and that is have a military judge. The problem is there's no military judge assigned this case. So how about the Chief Judge of the, uh, of the trial service? Uh, uh, the red light is on, Your Honor. May you I? May finish, Thank you. Uh, you may answer, Judge. Do you Holmes think question? that it there would be appropriate for this court to appoint the, the chief judge of the of the trial service to to be the military judge we envision in Pruner? No, Your Honor, I don't. However, I think the court could say, send an order to the chief. Uh, excuse me, the Judge Advocate General of the Navy, and ask him to ask the chief judge of the Navy Marine Corps uh, Trial Judiciary if he would either himself, Captain uh, Peter McLaughlin, or act as a special master, All right. act as a special master, um, or appoint one of his judges. Uh, keep in mind, though, that when you do that, and, and the Institute does not disagree that that might be the best way to do this, but keep in mind that if you ask the chief judge of the trial judiciary to do it, at some point in time, one of his judges is going to sit in the trial of United States versus King. And so it may be more appropriate um, to have the to, JAG uh, ask him to appoint one of his judges and that judge be the, the trial judge in King. If there is a trial judge. If there is. If there, if there, um, well, but that's why you should exercise jurisdiction. There's going to be a trial in this case. What if the this judge is? doesn't have the security clearance? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe he should that's get the, one. <laughs> well, but, Your Honor, that would, wouldn't that be the fault of the Judge Advocate General of the Navy for once again providing a lawyer in a national security case that's not My qualified. question to counsel was very simple. As a court of law, should we review the acts and delects of the Judge Advocate General, or, is, or should we be in position to order the acts? Uh, I'm just curious as to what our role in the Uniform Code of Military Justice is. Is it, uh, is it to supervise and, and authorize him to proceed because he, we think he's a nice guy, he doesn't need clearances and all that, or we, or we state what the law is and leave it up to others to implement it? If they don't, we take the appropriate remedy at the appropriate time. If they do, then we take no action at the appropriate time. Isn't that the way the system normally works? Um, if you're talking about it in terms of the tension between JAG's Article 6 authority and, and this court, uh, maybe so and maybe it is somewhat tenuous. Well, I was thinking in the context of this proceeding is Article 26 responsibility to detail competent counsel. And it seems to me that you cannot have a competent counsel unless the counsel has the requisite security clearances. Uh, this is true. And, and, and so without them, you can never have a competent counsel or you have to proceed on the, without classified information. Um, but I think we start to get into the other issue that's not before the court, which is the other writ, and in, in in perhaps the underlying question in the show cause order that was issued by the court earlier is, is you may be asking in reality, should the Judge Advocate General be a party to this case as one of the um, people listed along with Admiral Mobley? Well, isn't a classic way that appellate courts deal with matters such as this is just abate the proceedings until the dominoes are stood up again? That certainly is another option. Um, besides uh, appointing a special master or remanding the case, um, holding this case in abatement is another option. Yes, Your Honor. Of course, we then have a habeas corpus issue as to how long can Petty Officer King be detained. Uh, habeas corpus or speedy trial under Article 10? Uh, but either way, you'll, you'll address the issue. That's true, Your Honor. 
And I the apologize. The clock doesn't start running until arraignment, and we have not not had an arraignment. It's um, clock. He's in pretrial confinement, so I think under Article 10, the minute they put him in um, under restraint, in fact, it, go, it probably 10. goes even further back. And I, I noticed your clock is already running. I, I have. <laughs> Uh, there are probably members of the audience here who will say that's not an expected to run. on that side, too? <laughs> um, thank you very much. I have exceeded my time, and I appreciate being here before you on behalf of the National Institute of Military Justice. Well, you've exceeded your time because of our questions, in, in all fairness. Uh, thank, you. Thank, you, thank you, Chief very Judge. Much. Well, now hear from Mr. Donald Rykoff on behalf of the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. And welcome, Mr. Rykoff. May it please the court and counsel. On behalf of the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, we appreciate the opportunity to participate in what we believe is a very important case, not only for Petty Officer King, but also for the military justice system as a whole, but a third aspect that we would ask the court to keep in the context, and that is the proper role of counsel and the role of this court over military and civilian counsel who practice within the military justice system. Uh, if I might uh, indulge in one, one aspect concerning the jurisdictional issues, I would note that uh, this court denied a writ recently in the case of Johnston versus uh, the Air Force uh, on a very similar jurisdictional issue, although we would submit that that case has no applicability because of the context that this being an article pre-article 32 situation where that was a post appellate application for relief i would also like to address a comment by a couple of your honors and that is is the uh, authority or the option of this court to refer the matter back to the navy tj uh, well certainly uh, this course has a whole range of options that it could impose to including ordering the proceedings to be abated. Uh, we would note that, I believe as Mr. Cave pointed out, there is one problem with uh, the suggestion of the Navy TJAG in being involved at that juncture, and that is that the TJAG, while he has supervisory responsibility that's delegated to him under the UCMJ, he has no command authority, even if he wanted to exercise it, over the convening authority in this particular case. As our military structure is set up, the convening authority is the one who's been given the jurisdiction, if you will, to decide that, and it flows from the summary court-martial jurisdiction to the special court-martial. And, and does the uh, convening authority outrank, as a matter of rank, uh, the, the uh, judge advocate general? Your Honor, if one accepts the premise that, at least in the context of this case, that an Article 32 proceeding is a judicial proceeding, it must. Uh, we are talking about not a pre-preferral situation where there might be a different rule, but we've already exceeded that. There has been a preferral. So we're at the quote-unquote critical stage uh, where, of course, the Sixth Amendment becomes implicated. So to answer your question, I think that the TJ could offer advice, but were TJ to inject him or herself into the situation, we would now get into perhaps a collateral command influence type of situation, and we're not advocating that, by the way, that that, that should be done. Counsel, I'm, I'm, oh, go ahead. I'm missing something here. Uh, typically, the orders of this court uh, go to the Judge Advocate General to refer matters to convening authorities, and the orders of this court have parameters to them. And it's always been my understanding that in transmitting those orders, that the Judge Advocate General is not in any way subordinate to the convening authority, no matter what the rank of the convening authority is, but that the convening authority is bound by the terms of those orders to follow them. So if we specify a particular type of hearing or rehearing on, on a remand and put parameters uh, to it, that convening authority must obey. And in those few cases where they haven't obeyed, uh, the defense counsel has promptly come back to that court, and the convening authority has been reminded as to the difference between a grade structure and court orders. Certainly, Your Honor, and, and that is a classic example of something that would be in aid of this court's jurisdiction. In those situations, traditionally, 
the matter arrived at this court in the traditional appellate review, and the TJAGs, the various services, are indeed the conduits, and more properly exercised, we would submit an administrative type of role. If that's the role that is being placed upon them in this case, then, of course, there probably is no issue. But if it's something where it's referred to the TJAG for them to exercise some type of judicial discretion, and that was my understanding. I understand your point. Counsel, as, sure. a, as a follow on to Judge Efron's question, let's assume this scenario. Assuming that we decide the jurisdiction issue and the right to counsel is issue as appellant has urged us to decide it, th then we essentially have made a legal ruling uh, that there is jurisdiction and that the present MOU with the security officer situation does violate the appellant's right to counsel. We've made a decision as to those two issues. And then if we were to uh, refer it back to the TJAG, remand it to the TJAG for action in conformance with that decision, and he refers it to the convening authority, there is no discretion on the part of the convening authority. In that, assuming that we decide it that uh, way. Under that assumption, Your Honor, I agree wholeheartedly on behalf of the NACDL, because at that juncture, there is no discretion. Uh, the discretion is being given back to the convening authority who may elect to proceed, may not, but then, as, as I believe Judge Efron suggested, counsel would be back here probably very quickly. Uh, so I, I think under that factual parameter, uh, the referral to the TJAG, again, is nothing more than administrative conduit. And I certainly didn't imply to presuppose how we would decide this case. Uh, and, and I understand that. If I could move on to the next point, and that is, is that I believe Judge Sullivan pointed out that there were needs on both sides here. Uh, the NACDL would question the government's need in the context of where this case is at procedurally. Again, I think it's extremely important for this court to focus on that this is a pre-referral case. It hasn't even gotten to the Article 32, although it was imminent at the time the writ was filed, and that's what uh, got, I believe, the... But he's in jail, yes. and he's been told what the charges that are being considered against him, and in one charge is espionage, uh, giving, giving classified material to the Russians, and two, or, and two, uh, two, two specifications of violating... Uh, classified regulations by disclosing classified material. Certainly, Your Honor. But the, the point is, is if one, at least is the NACDL, reads Rule 405G and Rule 505 of the MREs, those rules make a very big distinction between a case that's in the pre-referral mode than once a case gets referred, because certainly once it's referred, then there is a military judge that can act as the, yes. the arbitrator. That gets to another concern of mine. Do we not need, in, the, in your view, on behalf of your association, do we not need a judge, an impartial judge or master at the trial level to, to supervise the proceedings and tensions of these needs in this case? Your Honor, in preparing our brief, one of the issues, if I just might have the indulgence, we did look at the history of the Classified Information Procedures Act, which, and we could find no authority that that was designed, and probably intentionally so, to apply to the military. Well, uh, 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 that concept of the CEPA uh, Act is, is uh, the Classified Documents, uh, or Classified Information Procedures Act, is, uh, it, it, there is a judge at the trial level that, that does that, and that is the U.S. District Court judge. Exactly, and that would be a far preferable situation because we probably wouldn't be arguing here. But, but we have federal judges in the military justice system. We have trial judges. Yes. And, and one of them could be detailed, an impartial trial judge, to, to bec become a referee or an arbiter uh, of these tensions between the needs uh, of moving the trial and, and uh, possible breakage of the attorney-client privilege. We agree with the caveat that we're not talking about a balancing of the Sixth Amendment, but a balancing of interests, as you pointed out, between the needs of the government and the defense, that this court could say that a remedy that would satisfy both sides would be for the convening authority to have 
or the TJAG, whoever has the authority, to detail an appropriately cleared uh, military judge to indeed, and I would refer the court to the bin Laden case that's been mm -hmm. cited, because that case the judge took a very active role in sorting through who was going to deal with various issues, and I think that's a very good and commendable procedure. Counsel, putting aside the issue of the use of laypersons as Article 32 officers, could this function be performed by an Article 32 officer? That is, if there was a condition precedent that these matters be sorted out by the Article 32 officer before the case proceeds? Could it, Your Honor, I suppose in an abstract, in, in practice, uh, I suspect if I were the defense counsel in Mr. Turley's situation, I may have some concerns uh, about that because the role of the investigating officer is slightly different, and that is to factually investigate the nature of the charges, and I believe that there might indeed be a conflict between sorting out clearance issues that are necessary then to proceed with the factual development, because as I understand, one of their major problems is, is that because of the uncertainty of the protective order's scope and the ramifications, counsel are understandably uh, chilled in not wanting to communicate with each other and prepare for the Article 32. I understand the answer to the question. Thank you. I thank the court on behalf of our association. Thank you very much, and we thank you for your contribution this morning. Thank you. We'll now hear from the government. Good morning, Your Honors. Lieutenant Commander mm -hmm. Philip Sundell for the United States. This court should not grant appellant's requested relief for three reasons. First, the proceedings in this case are at such a preliminary stage that they have not yet reached this court's area of jurisdiction. Second, even if this court does have jurisdiction, the matters raised in the writ are not extraordinary in nature and are not deserving of treatment via an extraordinary writ. Finally, appellant has failed to prove that he is clearly indi and indisputably entitled to the relief requested, which is the standard for an extraordinary writ. Counsel, uh, the, uh, the, I outlined to your opposing counsel needs of, of King at this stage, who's in prison, and, and the needs of the government. The needs of King is to prepare for trial and to in the circumstances that we find ourselves in to protect the attorney-client privilege. Do you agree with those needs? Yes, Your Honor. All right. How about the needs of the government? The needs of the government are... I, 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 just to refresh your recollection, uh, I, I said uh, proceed to a possible trial under the UCMJ using all your statutory requirements. And that is go to Article 32 and then and so on and, and a possible trial. That's one of your needs. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, the second is the need to conduct a debriefing to determine possible damage done to our nation's security by uh, uh, the possible disclosure of classified information to the Russian embassy. If Your Honor means... I have not seen people address that need, but <clears throat> is that not a need of the government? If Your Honor means a debriefing of the accused, that would... That would obviously have to wait the potential outcome of the case itself. Well, why should it? If you can reach accommodation uh, between uh, the counsel and you don't break the attorney-client privilege and you don't force him to say anything in crimination, why should not the government proceed to determine what damage has been done to our nation's security? Certainly, if appellant is willing to cooperate. Well, he, let's, let's get you guys together and... and and, and uh, because to me, that's, that's a, a, a very important uh, need of the government. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, for all we know, our, our nation's security has been, we don't know, may, may have been compromised, and our nation needs to take some steps to, to right. counter that. Uh, Counsel, if, if I may interrupt for one question there, Your Honor? Yes. As I read the, <laughs> as I read the, filings of the government in this case, the case in which the government has been very active in concern about national security information, the government has not asserted an interest or desire in engaging in such debriefing in this case, has it? Your Honor, I'm not aware of what negotiations, of any, have I'm gone I'm just talking about the, the record before us now. No, has, has it's, the government... it's not in the record. Okay. 
and I was talking about the general needs of both sides and to see if there cannot be a, a court, uh, help, uh, order from this court to help both sides accomplish all their needs without compromising his Sixth Amendment right to counsel and his Fifth Amendment right to self uh, incrimination. Yes, Your Honor, but another very important need of the government at this point in time is to prevent future harm. Well, I was going to get to that. Uh, there, there's uh, another need, and, and that is to prevent King from disclosing future, in the future, in futuro, uh, classified documents to unauthorized people. That's one of your needs, too. Yes, Your Honor, but it, it, because of the nature of this case, it goes beyond that. The nature of the classified information is such that untrained individuals, uncleared counsel who have not been read into the programs and have not been educated, may obtain information which they do not realize is classified. Well, then there's the need to get the clearances and to have non-disclosure forms filed and maybe briefing of them as to what they need to stay away from and what they don't need to, you know. Yes, Your Honor, and until... That's the third need, and, and, and those are all three important needs, and then there's this fourth need, the need to conduct command visits to make sure that, that King is being properly... Uh, well, that's the second, that's Your Honor. That's not, that's not presently before the court. Well, it, it is before the court because logs have been submitted showing access to King by the command to conduct these... Uh, command visits to in yeah, yes your honor even assuming that that is before the court just as with the issues in the first writ there is a mechanism to deal with those things and it's not an extraordinary writ if a appellant believes we're just focusing on needs and then we're going to get to the what we do about it okay your honor that, do, you, that, do you agree to those four needs that is a need yes right now now let's get to the solution of the needs in, in the may Pruner I, may I case... May one little quick question before you get to the solution? Your I Honor. yield to my colleague from South Carolina. <laughs> Where does the presumption of innocence fall into this? All this debriefing and everything. I mean, if a guy is not guilty of anything, who gets to debrief? That's what true, is? Your Honor. He may, he may in I fact... Mean, I realize that the nation has an important national security interest, but at some point in time... Uh, there is a presumption of innocence somewhere around there. Of course, there's a presumption of innocence. We have to until put that day. into the solution, too, don't we? Well, given the nature of your statement uh, of the importance of cleared counsel, why were uh, counsel appointed to this case that were not cleared, at least one of them? Your Honor, the, as with most systems today, the, the detailing of counsel, the decision of who is going to be assigned as a defense counsel to a case is within the defense bar. And the Navy is not any different that way. The decision in this case of who would be detailed as military counsel in this case was made by the senior defense attorney who owns the defense counsel. Counsel, is there anything in the Uniform Code of Military Justice or the Manual for Courts Martial <clears throat> that recognizes a defense bar as being responsible for the assignment of counsel? No, Your Honor. The in, the, in the Uniform Code of Military Justice, is it not the Secretary of the Navy that's responsible for the assignment of defense counsel? Yes, Your Honor. And the Navy has moved towards uh, independence between the prosecution and the defense, largely on behalf of the courts, which has encouraged such a movement. Are you representing the Secretary of the Navy today? Yes. You represent, we had a question before about whether the Judge Advocate General should be a party to this. Are you representing the Judge Advocate General? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Well, why is it that the Secretary of the Navy and the Judge Advocate General have not either in this case or generally established procedures to ensure that when there is a capital, potential capital case involving classified information, that the counsel who are appointed to that case are qualified in terms of the classification level and are not going to be counsel who, as described by the government in its own April 24th filing, are relatively inexperienced. The, they, those, those individuals, those offices have done so, Your Honor. The instruction cited by the government in its response to the show cause order requires the, the detailing authority of defense counsel to keep in mind several factors, one of which is explicitly stated being a, an appropriate security clearance. Well, who is before the court today who can explain to us why inexperienced, unqualified counsel were appointed to represent 
the client in this, the appellant in this case, who's facing a potential capital case. Your Honor, given the difficulties that the government has run into in trying to become involved in the defense, in any defense issues in this case, the government is not, uh, this representative of the government, this part of the government, is not in a position to ask defense counsel why they made detailing decisions. So the defense counsel is some entity separate from the Secretary of the Navy who you represent today that nobody who represents the Secretary of the Navy can speak for. No, Your Honor, it's, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a recognized need for independence in the system. As, as counsel for appellant has, has stated, have, as all of the earlier um, counsel stated, there's allegedly a fear of retribution on, on, the, on the defense counsel's part. They are afraid that they're going to get in trouble for their activities in this case. Given those claims of concern, the government has to be very, very sensitive of what is perceived as prosecutorial intervention in the defense bar. But as I understand, you are not here today solely representing the convening authority or representing the government in its prosecutorial sense. You're representing the Secretary of the Navy, who is charged with the administration of military justice with respect to the appointment of defense counsel by Congress. That is true, Your Honor, but to, to, to keep the division of responsibilities true, there has to be some level of, for lack of a better phrase, one part of the government not knowing why the other part is doing what it's doing. Well, if we talk about that separation, when the Uniform Code of Military Justice was originally enacted in 1951, the convening authority was made responsible for the appointment of defense counsel. Yes, sir. And the Military Justice Act of 1983, that responsibility was taken away from the convening authority, the legislative history makes it very clear that it's to keep the convening authority out of the defense counsel business. How do you reconcile that with the government's filing in this case, which says that the convening authority interjected himself into the defense business by appointing a member of the defense team? The, the convening authority has a responsibility to provide expert assistance to the defense team upon request. So there is some role of the convening authority in supplementing the defense team. In the, this particular case, because it is a national security case, because of the grave concerns that the government has regarding the possibility of future compromise of classified information of an extremely t sensitive nature, the convening authority arrived at what was believed to be the least intrusive compromise between the competing interests. This court has recognized the government's interest in protecting national security even in a court-martial case. So it was less intrusive to interject a member of the defense team by the convening authority than two months ago or three months ago sending a letter to the defense counsel in this case saying you need to have a uh, TS, SCI clearance, here's the application, fill it out, this is a requirement for your representation of the counsel in this case. Your Honor, the government doesn't believe that there was ever a mystery that an appropriate clearance level was needed. Has the government ever sent that letter? Is there anything in this record that shows that the government has sent that letter to the defense counsel in this case? Yes, Your Honor, the, the protective orders. For instance, the protective order of 20 December 99, paragraph 3F, says there are two conditions precedent to attaining access to classified information. Was that, was that served on the Civilian Defense Council in this case? Your Honor, the defense team is a team. They're presumed to talk to each other. And when these conversations took place, as I understand from the record, it appears to be undisputed, someone from the government told at least one of the defense counsel, don't bother to follow up on, on this because your, your mother's a foreign national and you're never going to get the clearance in time. The, we, we do not know what that communication was. The counsel, if, if that communication did take place, as soon as the convening authorities personnel heard about that, they said, no, that is not true, go forward with it. The government believes that it's been clear from the beginning that access to classified information would require an appropriate clearance. This court's own case law says that access to classified information requires an appropriate clearance. No counsel- Getting on to that uh, uh, case law of our court, uh, would you say that the Pruner case controls? The Pruner case is certainly helpful, yes, Your Honor. All right, in the last section, it outlines uh, how, uh, the last paragraph outlines how uh, a matter involving 
a defense team and classified documents should be handled. Would yes, you, Your Honor. Do you think that should be handled in this case in that manner? Require the, the requirement that counsel get obtain clearance, certainly. And a non-disclosure form. Certainly. Okay. Now, uh, we don't have a military. The problem is, uh, is in, in implementing Pruner, uh, uh, we don't have a military judge assigned at this time. Uh, how about the chief judge of the uh, trial service? Uh, Your Honor, that, Appointing that... someone at this, at this stage and, and, and letting them supervise this this problem that returns to the jurisdictional question congress has set up a system whereby judicial su supervision of the military justice system does not begin until referral that is when the case begins that is when the judge becomes part of the court but of you're the familiar in pruner there was a, a waiver of an article 32 and then there was a referral mm -hmm. and then the military judge says the waiver is invalid we're going to have it back to an article 32. absolutely your honor so, so there was a, by a happenstance there was a judge before the 32 at that in this case not by happenstance at all your honor that's what the rules provide for okay. after referral one of the things the military judge can do is can review the appropriateness of the article 32 and grant appropriate relief if necessary can the can system this court is order a military judge to be appointed at this stage if it does so it will be doing so apparently in violation of congress's scheme for the military justice system if Congress can, can the Secretary of the Navy, uh, following up on Judge Efron's question, can, can, uh, with his power, can he appoint uh, or direct that a military judge be appointed to solve this, this perplexing problem at this stage? The, the Secretary of the Navy could take the case and appoint a different investigating officer. There does not appear to be a mechanism for judicial oversight prior to referral. And con as this court recognized in McPhail, and I I'll quote, Congress created an integrated system of military courts and review procedures. That integrated system does not impose judicial oversight until referral. If there was a trial judge appointed in this case, couldn't that trial judge mediate between both sides and get to a, a proper solution where the needs of both parties could be met the and the Constitution complied with? The system as set up by Congress does not, does not appear to allow for or to want. And we're not flexible enough to do it ourselves? Not if it's beyond the court's jurisdiction. Oh. How about... Council, well, I, go ahead. Let me ask you this question. Are investigating officers in the Department of the Navy typically attorneys as they are in the Department of the Army and the Department they, of the Air Force? They are, Your Honor. Another question. You mentioned a fear of retribution on behalf of the defense bar in the Navy. Doesn't that raise a serious question about the viability, effectiveness, and independence of military defense counsel in the Department of the Navy? Only if the government interjected itself in the detailing process as the questions from Judge Efron uh, appear to indicate. Right now, the system is operating as it is intended to operate. Two of the counsels who have been detailed to this case had the appropriate clearance. One of them was the senior trial counsel of that Navy Legal Service Office. For some reason, which is unknown to this part of the government, that senior attorney with the appropriate clearance approximately a month later was undetailed from the case. So the, the system is operating as it's intended to, and if after referral, when there is judicial supervision of the system, these issues are still ripe for review, there is a mechanism to review them. Okay. Let me ask this question, and again, it's, it's cutting to the chase. If Civilian Defense Council applies for a security clearance, is the government willing to process that request for a security clearance with all deliberate speed? Yes, Your Honor. My understanding is that an interim decision could be reached on the request for security clearance within a matter of weeks. An interim would, would bring that level of clearance to the level that is needed and not simply an interim secret or top yes, secret? Yes, Your Honor. It would be an interim for the final clearance, assuming the clearance was, was uh, assuming the council qualified for the clearance. Then the, the, the final clearance will take several months after that, but the interim clearance is sufficient to obtain access to the information. That's when you needed. say interim clearance, you mean uh, the streamline attorney uh, uh, clearance requirements uh, that are cited uh, in Pruner? 
well, although the, it was the, an Army regulation. The, the Army and Pruner set up a special streamlined process for that particular And the case. Navy can't do send the same as the Army? The Navy could do so. It's not, it has not yet done so in this case because no request has been made. A council has simply refused to solve this problem. Appellant and his council hold within <clears throat> their hands the keys to this dispute. All they have to do is sign the MOUs and apply for and obtain the proper clearances, and the issue is done. So if, the end of it. Turley, if the professor gets up here and says, I request the security clearance and I will sign a form, right now uh, the problem, according to you, would be solved? The, prob the, the problem about what happens once the security clearance is obtained is solved. The, the issue of what procedures the government is allowed to institute to protect national security until the council get the proper clearances remain. Council, that was the thrust of my questions before about the Secretary of the Navy, not whether the Secretary of the Navy is going to conduct an investigation as to the possible incompetence of the head of the NILSO in terms of who was appointed to this case, but whether the Secretary of the Navy is going to ensure that competent counsel are available in this case right now. Instead of worrying about whether the ball is up in the air and who's going to fire first uh, or sign first or apply for an application first, why hasn't the Secretary of the Navy taken a hold of this case and said, somebody make sure that those clearances are uh, applied for and promptly processed? Because the issue was brought before this court as quickly as appellant could possibly bring it before this court, and the government's attempts to have counsel do what was necessary have not succeeded. The, the, the counsel ha are on, on notice as to what they are expected to and required to do to obviate this issue, to get rid of this issue. They have not done so. Sounds to me like we have a case of what uh, one of my former employers used to call a violent agreement. <laughs> Was that the same per way? Perhaps, Your Honor. Uh, may, uh, may, before you run out of time, uh, what's the government's position? Uh, well, let me ask it a different way. What would you envision would happen if we just de deny everything today? Just dismiss all of this and say, Well, Your Honor. Say the government's right. This is a convening authority problem. What do you envision is going to happen? The system will track as the system is intended to track. The Article 32 will go forward. The convening authority will use that Article 32 for the purpose, which is the primary purpose of an Article you 32. You don't envision yourself down on Pennsylvania Avenue with a habeas corpus petition, Sixth Amendment allegations? No, Your Honor. Uh, you, you don't. Uh, you no, think the Navy can confine a, a Navy member and a prisoner and deny him a right to counsel? Your Honor. First of all, the, go the government is absolutely not denying him the right to counsel. He presently has at least one detailed counsel who is cleared to discuss anything they need to discuss. Without this monitor there. Absolutely. And that's been clear from the time that the government s made sure that, the, that it was in writing that the monitor does not need to be present between conversations of people that I have the same I thought you said that, that lawyer undi got undetailed. No, absolutely Still not. Another one he there. has removed himself from participation in the case. Once this writ was filed, the, the detailed counsels started backing off, <clears throat> presumably because they were afraid that if they actually involved themselves in their case, it would damage their appeal, their, their, their writ before this court. But additionally, Your Honor, if at heart this is an issue of severance of counsel, which it is, if at heart what what the ultimate question is is do these does the imposition of the ISO prohib, pro, prevent counsel uncleared counsel from representing their client as they as they feel they need to that is a severance of counsel issue a severance of counsel issue is not an extraordinary matter the Supreme Court said in Flanagan that a severance of counsel issue is not an extraordinary matter. It's a very important matter. It's a constitutional matter. It's a matter of significant gravity. It is not extraordinary. It is not the subject of an, it is not appropriately the subject of an extraordinary writ. So this, the matter that is currently before this well, court. Well, how would the government prefer a ruling of this court to, to read? Would you say we have no jurisdiction? 
accordingly dismissed. Uh, we have jurisdiction, but this one is not extraordinary, accordingly dismissed. The government believes that the court does not have jurisdiction because the Congress has set up the system so that judicial oversight does not begin until uh, referral. I understand that argument, and I agree with that argument. Do you think it applies to habeas corpus? No. No, Your Honor. Habeas corpus is and different. Do you agree that this sailor is detained in a prison? This is not a habeas writ. I know it. Yes, That'll he is detained. That'll be the detained. next one. Yes, Your Honor, he is detained. <laughs> Okay. He is detained. Habeas corpus is dis different. The Supreme Court has called the writ of habeas corpus the great writ. And in Parisi, which is cited in the government's pleadings, the Supreme Court said that the great writ has a preferred place in our constitutional system. A writ of habeas corpus appears to carry with it its own subject matter jurisdiction. It is, is the person in confinement when he or she should not be? That is the subject matter jurisdiction. That, that is not the case here. We do not have a great writ here. We do not have a, a, a situation where Congress has intended judicial oversight. And that, that's shown also by this court's struggling. What if we did have a great writ here? The great what would, what would your position be if this was a writ for habeas corpus? That appellant is appropriately in pretrial confinement that he should not be released from pretrial confinement, and that if the question is a severance of counsel issue, it will be reviewed in the appropriate course of appellate review, so, as severance of counsel issues are. So it wouldn't make any difference if this was a great writ or, or, or an all writ? Well, the subject matter of the writ would be different. The but, subject but the matter would be But the government's position released. would be the same, do nothing. Well, the subject matter of the writ would be re release from confinement, and the issue regarding whether appellant should be released would be different than the issue here of whether the government has interfered with a Sixth Amendment right. So it's a fundamentally different issue. The fact that this court is, uh, appears to be struggling with the appropriate remedy in this case also demonstrates that this Congress did not intend judicial oversight at this stage. The fact that the, we don't know who to remand this to, who to give the order to, who to impose on the convening authority to decide if what was done was appropriate or was not appropriate. The reason we do not know the answer to those questions is because judicial oversight should not yet have begun. Now, the rules make clear that once this case is referred, if it is referred, the judge may look at the proceedings of the Article 32 and grant appropriate relief. In fact, if this case is allowed to go to the Article 32, the I.O., who this court has recognized as a quasi-judicial figure, can also potentially take appropriate relief. Can the investigating officer exercise all the powers that a federal district court judge could exercise with respect to um, limiting the proceedings until uh, counsel is appropriately cleared and that the invest and that the security classification procedures comport with uh, those standards subject to their consistency with the UCMJ. No, Your Honor. Congress and the President have limited the investigating officer's authority. So the investigating officer could say, this is, this is a terrible proceeding uh, in the way that the uh, ISO has been imposed upon the defense counsel case. I don't like it, but the, the authority that the investigating officer is zero at that point, can't do anything about it. No, Your Honor, it's not zero. The investigating officer owns the investigation. If he believes that he needs additional information to determine what an appropriate recommendation in the case is, he can order that that information be presented to him. If he believes that the convening authority should do certain things, then as a quasi-judicial figure, he can make those recommendations to the convening authority, and perhaps the convening authority will do what the I.O. suggests. Who is the I.O. in this case? I'm sorry, Your Honor. It's in one of the earliest pleadings. It's a, it's a commander. Is that investigating officer a, uh, a JAG? I believe that he is. I believe that he's a JAG with the appropriate clearance for this case. Can the government today agree to... Uh, is, is the Article 32 scheduled? If it is scheduled. It's been stayed by this court. That's correct. Um, can, the, can the government agree not to hold the Article 32 until they have at least made a decision on the security clearance application of civilian defense counsel? If Civilian Defense Council will make an application and will sign the MOU, I believe that the... Well, now you realize Civilian Defense Council has raised a significant legal issue about the MOU and the interference with the right to counsel. I, I, 
government doesn't understand. You, you may not agree with that, that right. issue, but, but a significant issue has been raised. And if we, for example, were to decide that there's merit to that issue. With respect to the invest, the, the, with the respect ISO. To the ISO. If, if the Article 32 proceeding is stayed, then presumably defense counsels need to discuss potentially classified information with the accused is also stayed. The, the if we lift the stay, if this court lifts the stay, is the government willing to postpone scheduling of the Article 32, postpone holding the Article 32, until they've had an opportunity to review the application for a security clearance on behalf of the Civilian Defense Council. Your Honor, I apologize. Although today I speak for the entire Navy, I have not discussed that issue with the convening authority. I don't feel that I have the authority to bind the convening authority on that issue. I apologize. I could certainly discuss that with the convening authority, and if, that, if the court desires, I can file a supplementary pleading with the, with the court telling, informing the court whether the government is, if, whether the convening authority would be willing to do that. I can't say that now because that issue did, was not, did not come up. What well, is the if name? If we have a need for that information, we'll, we'll request that. Thank you, Your Honor. What is the name of the convening authority who brought these charges? Uh, he, his position is the um, com Commander in Chief Naval Air, Naval, Com, Air, Land. That, uh, is that on uh, Naval, Air Force. Naval Air Forces <laughs> Atlantic? Okay. Uh, uh, does he have a name, or do they just call him Com Nav Fleet? <laughs> <laughs> he does, Your Honor. I, his name is uh, Vice Admiral J. S. Mobley. Mobley. Sorry okay, about that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, turning very, very briefly to the to the issue of the ISO itself, if if I may try to uh, do that before my time runs out. This court has recognized the, the significant governmental interest in protect, protecting national security. And indeed, in Gagnon, this court recognized the difference between a, a civilian trial, even a civilian national security trial, and a military national security trial. What may not be allowed in a civilian national security you may finish it out there. Thank you, Your Honor. What may not be allowed in a civilian national security trial might be allowed in a military trial because the interests differ. The systems are not always identical, and they are not intended to be identical. This is one of those situations. There are no further questions. Thank you very much, Counsel. Thank we'll you. now hear rebuttal. I believe this is what is called in these environs as a target-rich environment, and so I'm going to attempt to hit all the points uh, raised uh, by opposing counsel. First, I'd like to stress at the outset that the issue of which counsel is cleared is largely immaterial in one sense. Petty Officer Daniel King is entitled to uncleared counsel. He's entitled to counsel even if they refuse a clearance. I'm not going to refuse a clearance. I had a clearance at NSA. I'm more than willing to get a clearance now. But if I refused a clearance, or if I brought in 20 attorneys that refused a clearance, he's a right to those attorneys. And in past national security cases, that has been the practice. It is often the case, as in this case, for the government to say, we are only going to extend a certain number of clearances. Now, the rest of the attorneys on the defense team don't go south. They remain counsel. It's just has, they... has there ever been, has there been a case, because I didn't see any of the citations, in which a court has affirmatively stated that you have a right to representation by uncleared counsel in a classified information case. Absolutely, Your Honor. Which That's the Musha that? case. The Musha case, the, the, um, the government first stated that they wanted clearances, then withdrew that uh, request. All of the lawyers in that case, dealing with top secret, were I understand unclear. my reading of the Musha case is that the court did not hold that. Rather, the court found that, in effect, its uh, own authority through the court security officer established a de facto clearance procedure that relying on the court's authority over the individuals in the case they didn't say people who don't participate in this process can still be counsel uh, your honor all i can say the, the reason it is not in the cases is because this has not come up i mean the you know i've been involved in national security cases including the nicholson espionage case I was uncleared in that case because we had two cleared lawyers. But that, that answers my question then, that, that a court has not specifically held that you have a right to uncleared counsel. No, but uh, that right is based on the Sixth Amendment. Uh, the, the fact is that all of these cases, the protective orders deal with the handling and access to 
classified information. That was the purpose of the 20 December protective order. That protective order doesn't deal with unclassified communications. It deals with what you have to do if you want access to classified information and how you handle it. It doesn't make any reference at all to the access of a lawyer to our client. It deals with our access to classified information. Quite frankly, I don't care what was involved in this case in a classified fashion. I'll get a clearance if that's required, but I think it's immaterial. I don't care what he was doing. I don't care what, what allegedly was passed. I don't think they have an espionage case. But if they want a clearance from defense counsel, we'll certainly get it. But the one thing that I would caution this court is that I believe that it is facially incorrect to say that the government can insist that every lawyer on the defense team has a clearance. I don't believe it can do that. Well, look at United States versus Pruner, uh, 33 MJ at 275. Do you have that? Yes, I've read it, Your Honor. Okay. In, in, that, in that, quoting Judge Latimer and Nichols, it says, in the event uh, defense counsel refused to initiate a request for with this information base or becomes adamant, dilatory, or otherwise seeks to delay the judicial process, and he's referring to not getting any clearance, the government should be permitted to proceed. And he's, uh, he's indicating proceed uh, with the Article 32. Your Honor, I believe that what Pruner was referring to there is that if your counsel refuses to go get a clearance, the court may prevent the counsel from being present during discussion of classified information. And that may certainly be the case with the defense lawyer. If I go out and create a hundred person defense team, and only three of them have clearances, the court may be able to exclude 97 of them from any portions of the trial that include that information. What the court cannot do is to say that if you can afford a 100-member attorney team, you're not allowed to use them. I can have my client meet with specialists in constitutional law, specialists in appeals, specialists in any possible thing. In all of these protective orders, the thing that triggered special procedures is when the defense stated that they wanted access to classified information, want to discuss classified information. If you look at Lockheed, for example, the security officer in that case was only mentioned in terms of being present at a meeting when there was a deposition in which it was known that classified information would be discussed. That's how these protective orders work. Let so, me see if I, if I understand the defense's position perhaps a bit more clearly. You are saying you do not need to have a security clearance in order to represent Petty Officer King in this matter. That's correct, Your Honor. And you understand if you do not have a security clearance, you would not have access to the classified information in this case. That's correct, Your Honor. And you believe that the ISO assigned to the defense team can help you safeguard releases of classified information to you without reporting back to the government? Well, that's correct if he is a defense expert. If, I, if he's an expert assigned, I'm lead counsel so far in this case, and I should be able to decide how I'm going to use him. If he is someone who comes to my doorstep and says, by the way, this is a gift from your government, and, you know, loathe it be you if you should ever be separate from him, then I'm going to say, you know what, I'm going to turn back the gift. I uh, Never lo look a gift horse in the mouth. <laughs> yes, no, this, this is one ferocious gift horse. Well, maybe I should ask this question then. Do you feel that you need a security clearance in order to represent King in this matter? Well, it depends upon the government's position below. I don't believe that this trial needs classified information uh, because we're willing to stipulate to many of the facts in this case because we could care less about what occurred on that classified program. But if the government adopts this mosaic theory, then what you're going to have is a flurry of challenges. I've never seen a mosaic theory cited in a case like this before to the exclusion of counsel, and I believe that it will fail. But more importantly, if the, if the government operates the way it has been operating in terms of the use of classification, and they try to use that to exclude the defense team, then we will challenge it again. The government has a burden to put reasonable classification standards in, in a case. They've suggested so far that under the mosaic theory, even unclassified issues can be classified because of the mosaic effect. And they will use that effect then to exclude counsel because you can create a mosaic um, even of information that may not be classified. I would suggest to you the mosaic theory is something that I am painfully familiar with from the Area 51 case, and that, that theory has been used very seldomly. It has never been used in a case like this, and it will not withstand judicial review. I was shocked to see it mentioned here. But what I would emphasize to the, to the court is that I am prepared to get a clearance, always have. When the government says this, the key has always been in our hand, I find that something of a mystery. 
I was willing to sign an MOU. It's in the record. We asked for the MOU. We virtually took out an ad for the MOU. They didn't produce the MOU. Now, I can't sign things that I don't have. Counsel, getting back to the issue of the dialogue you had with Chief Judge Crawford about whether you need a security classification in this case, if this case were before a federal district court, would it be within the power of a federal district court judge to say, looking at the charges in this case, I believe it is reasonable to insist that every counsel have the security classification in this case because I don't want this case reviewed for ineffective assistance of counsel with a appellate counsel later looking at the case and say, how could that defense counsel try the case without looking at all the classified information in it? Well, Your Honor, first of all, I don't believe that the court has the authority to say that all counsel must be cleared or you can't have them for, for counsel. What the, so a what, district court couldn't say that, couldn't, look, because couldn't look at the charge and say that the lead counsel in this case has no, has no clearance, can't possibly provide effective defense counsel. Your Honor, there's a threefold answer to that. First of all... My understanding is that the district court has, that, has the power to determine who can represent someone before the court. Your Honor, I respectfully disagree. I don't think that the court can say that you can only have counsel with clearances under the Sixth Amendment. Every client is entitled, entitled to lawyers. Now, what they can see, what the court puts on is restrictions. If you don't have a clearance, you can't see X, Y, or Z is one thing, but you cannot deny access to the client. Uh, you, can, you can restrict how and when certain information uh, um, is handled. And in my view, if the government in this case uh, adopts that view, which I expect that they will uh, again below unless directed otherwise by this court, that this challenge will continue. But, but getting I, to what you said earlier, this is not necessarily an issue in this case because as you've asserted, there is no counsel in this case who is refusing to apply for a security clearance. No counsel thus far refusing for counsel uh, to uh, apply for a clearance, but I want to note only that if this court says that you can impose this requirement uh, on counsel, uh, then you are saying that a defendant doesn't have the right to uncleared counsel. What, back to Judge Sullivan's question uh, of someone earlier on, what do you propose as a solution other than dismissing the charges against your client? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's always a good starting place, Your Honor, and it's certainly efficient. I, but the solution, I think, is simple. First of all, this court should strike this protective order uh, as facially unconstitutional. Any role of this officer in a monitoring fashion, any at all, for any period of time, is facially unconstitutional. And I think that this court should remand with instructions that the court may impose a legitimate protective order uh, to govern the handling of national security information. Whatever protective order is issued cannot restrict counsel's access to the client, while it can restrict what can be discussed in um, uh, meetings between the client and an uncleared lawyer. What is, in my view, completely inappropriate is to refer to the nature of this case. I don't care what the nature of this case is. Whether I'm representing a thief or an accused spy, they have the same Sixth Amendment right. He's not convicted. And for them to say, well, look, there's, there's really anything could happen here. What the government is suggesting is reversing, if I could... Uh, May finish your answer. Please, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, as a law professor, I'm trained to speak in 50-minute increments. Um, <laughs> you only have 30 today. But, but, Chief Judge, uh, so the order would simply read, upon consideration of the motion for extraordinary relief, the protective order is found facially unconstitutional and hereby stricken. That's right, and we can go back downstairs they and see if we get along. Dissolved. Um, th that's correct, Your Honor. I think that this court should remand with some instructions in this case uh, that to give some some guidance. Well, but the thing don't normally get into advisory opinions as to how to. I don't think it'd be advisory opinion, Your Honor. I mean, what we have, frankly, is a 20-car pileup, and this court is it has the right to suggest how to untangle the cars. But I, I believe, Your Honor, that the one thing that the court should not do is take the uh, suggestion of the government, which is that they reverse the presumption in cases like Lockheed, Bin Laden, Musha, where if you state an interest to deal with classified information, a, you can have restrictions imposed against you. What the government would say is that the mere potentiality that classified information could be revealed is enough for them to impose a monitoring agent in any case. That would apply to thousands of cases in which defendants possess classified information, and it is that position that I think is both unconstitutional and untenable, and I thank this court for its time. In trial, what do you, without disclosing the trial strategy, uh, <laughs> if this thing does go to trial, uh, 
what do you envision your your trial team to look like? And do you do you have a do you envision having a mix of cleared and uncleared attorneys? I most certainly do. I have a number of attorneys that I would like to bring into this uh, this case uh, that have various specialties. I expect that the government is going to to say that they don't want to clear everyone. That has certainly been the case in past cases. What, do you expect that uh, you and and your uh, co-counsel here today will be cleared? I don't know if Lieutenant Commander Clant would be uh, dealing with the trial level material. Okay. I but How about yourself. Well, most certainly I, I intend to be there, and if I'm denied access, then um, I expect that we will probably um, um, have a future acquaintance again. Um, but would you uh, be willing to request uh, clearance today? Oh, I'm, I've always been willing to request a, a clearance because we've stated well, repeatedly. Not just be willing to actually request it. Say the words, I request a clearance. <laughs> on the record. Well, I've already stated that, Your Honor, and I'm more than willing to, to beseech you uh, for, a, for a clearance. But I want to note, if I can, in response to your question, Your Honor, uh, is that um, regardless of that request for, for a clearance, regardless of the interim issue, the very fun foundations of this protective order in restricting unclassified communications and the imposition of a monitoring agent can't be part of any part of this case. And ultimately, we are eager to get the trial. My client is facing death. He wants to talk to his lawyer. We think we have a strong case, but it's awfully hard to do that case if we have to mime directions to each other because we can't be in each other's presence. And I ask this court to intervene and to return this case back to the rule of law. Thank you. We, uh, we shall take this uh, matter under advisement and render a decision in due course. I would ask at this time that the amicus uh, attorneys uh, come forward. It is our uh, custom to greet attorneys in the well following oral argument. We shall now take a short recess. All rise. Saturday on America and the Courts, Associate Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens and Solicitor General Seth Waxman address members of the Seventh Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals in Chicago. America and the Courts, Saturday evening at 7.